in the 1940s in Spain. One of the most important pilgrimage routes in the whole of Christianity's history was a rat line. And down that is moving Nazi war criminals. The Catholic Church were heavily involved. Oh, look at this. This space was renovated to accommodate somebody. This is one of the greatest stories never told. Perfect place to hide. Previously on Hunting Hitler. If we could find an additional tunnel, it's very feasible that Hitler could have got out of Germany by aircraft. Oh, stop right there, George. What's that? Here is a song. We've got a tunnel here. It takes me right to the airport. We think that Hitler lived and got to Spain. Were the Nazi criminals using Vigo to escape from Europe? Without any kind of doubt. Oh, big pop. We got a pop. If that submarine is down there, it will be a treasure trove of evidence. Oh, there we go. We've got something man-made. In 2014, an executive order declassified over 700 pages of secret FBI documents, revealing that the U.S. government was investigating Adolf Hitler's whereabouts months and years after he was believed dead. In these files, there are thousands of leads. This is report after report after report. Bob Baer, 21-year CIA veteran and one of the most renowned intelligence minds in the world, has reopened a 70-year-old cold case, the death of Adolf Hitler. All the witnesses are dead. There's no fingerprints. There is no decent forensics. We are not going to make our conclusions in advance. I just want to do the definitive investigation on Hitler. But once and all, settle this damn thing. waters of southern Argentina. Speed's good now. We're at three knots, speed over ground. Tim Kennedy, U.S. Army Special Forces, and a team of world-renowned marine archaeologists are on the hunt for a sunken U-boat that may have been Hitler's escape vehicle to South America, as reported by a 1945 FBI file. Can you loop back and go back over that spot? OK. After three days of searching with state-of-the-art sonar, the team locates mysterious metal debris on the ocean floor. It's a solid straight line with at least one right angle in it. That's a good sized target. I think we got something for you guys to dive on. Yeah! Woo! That's absolutely a target. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure a man-made object. Yeah, there's a man-made object. It's definitely hard. You can see the, the bright return, which is a lot different than the geologic background. Joe, do you have any idea what that is? I don't, man, it's hard to say. It was surrounded by so much other features that I think the only way to really know is to, to put eyes on it. We have a metal object in the water. We know it's man-made. We're excited. Now, we got to get in the water and see what this is. What do we do? Well, we're getting towards the end of the day. Sunset's at 6.15, so I think we wrap it up now and regroup tomorrow morning and put some divers in to, to see what it actually is. All right. Tomorrow morning, we're going to come back. We're going to dive on it. We're going to see what's there. And I think we're going to find something. They're in now. Throw. They drop a buoy to mark the location of this underwater anomaly and will return at first light to search for what could be the final remains of a German U-boat. All right. <laughs> I'm a little excited. See what's there. Nice job, guys. It's definitely metal. It's definitely man-made. It, it fits in the parameters of a U-boat. Bob Baer and war crimes investigator John Sensich review the findings from the team off the coast of Argentina. If there's a U-boat down there, I can tell you that the potential for forensic evidence is enormous. We also need to look at where the U-boat supposedly left from, and that would be Vigo. After establishing that it was indeed possible for Hitler to have escaped Germany and uncovering declassified FBI files that cite Hitler seeking safe harbor in Spain, the team has determined the port town of Vigo would have been the ideal location for him to board a U-boat out of Europe. Vigo was an excellent exit point for Hitler, but what we don't know is his entrance point into Spain. 
you simply don't want to take the airplane you flew from Berlin and land it where you're catching a boat. It's too obvious. I would put the plane down early and then go on a land route. Question is, once he lands on the ground in Spain, how does he move? He's most vulnerable. From my experience supervising undercover operations, I'd have to say to get from point A to point B, he's going to have to be disguised. All we have to do then really is to look in this U.S. Embassy report. The following Germans left for Argentina from Vigo under the disguise of a priest. Well, that sounds like a rat line to me. After World War II, an intricate system of escape routes known as rat lines were established to help Nazi war criminals flee Europe. These rat lines were supported by both the Red Cross and the Catholic Church in Europe by providing false documentation and places of refuge. Many of these routes traveled through Spain. A lot of Catholics during World War II thought that Hitler was preferable to Joseph Stalin. So what we have here is a network of supporters to provide him with an infrastructure in Spain. If we could zero in on the rat lines around Vigo, what are the most likely spots could lead us to the airplane? What I've done is undertaken an analysis of the Catholic churches and monasteries. What really brought my attention is the largest monastery in the area. It's 125 miles from Vigo. Uh, it's in Samos. What's interesting about the Samos Monastery is that it was built in the 7th century. It's large, it's private, it's secluded. It has 200 subject churches. That can be translated into 200 potential safe houses. If this was truly a rat line, you will find witnesses there or documents that Germans were coming through. Yeah. I think we're really going to make this connection back to Berlin through Samos. It's key to the investigation. This must be it here. Look at the size of this place. Lenny DePaul, former commander of the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force, and Gerard Williams, investigative journalist, arrive at the massive monastery that has sat above the town of Samos, Spain, for nearly 1,400 years. The monastery itself is huge. At its height, there would have been hundreds of Benedictine monks here. Sanctuary is something the Catholic Church has always offered to people. But in this case, we have to find out if sanctuary was offered to Adolf Hitler. Yes, this is Xavier. Yeah. Hola. 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 Hi. Hi. The team makes contact with Galician historian Javier Quiroga, who has spent years writing a book about the Samos Monastery. The place is amazing, but we're here to look at the movements of Germans, escaped criminals, through Spain uh, at the end of the war. Si realmente este edificio ten moita historia escondida. Uh, this place has lots of history. In that period? Yeah. Desde 1930 to 1970. In 1930, it was an abbot here mm -hmm. called Mauro. OK. He was very close to Franco. Mauro but... had a lot of power because yeah. it was supported by Franco. What we have here is an abbot very close to a very close associate of Adolf Hitler, Cisco Franco, the dictator here. When the German war ends in 1945, mm -hmm. eh, they mm, began to, to come to the monastery. Here in the monastery, there's a lot of German military dressed like monks. He said that Germans come here in the monastery <coughs> because it's the way to be going. The route of the rats. The route of the rats. Route of the rats. And they used to do uh, false documents to give them a new identity. This isn't just a part of a rack line, the escape route for Nazis. This is a hub that connects the submarines to the city of Vigo. Next stop, South America. Also, he was talking with uh, many monks of that uh, time. Of that period, yeah. Yeah. And a man who worked here when he was 18 years old, he said that he saw here, with his eyes, Hitler. Here. Here? Yeah. Yeah. When? When was that? He said that the 1st of May of 1945. Hitler was here. He si. said so. Si, si.
a man who worked here said that he saw Hitler here in the monastery. Hitler was here. He said so. Newly declassified FBI files stating that Hitler could have fled Germany and sought refuge in Spain have led the team to the Samos Monastery, where an eyewitness places Hitler less than a month after his alleged death. The team has also discovered that the monastery may have been a hub on the rat lines, an underground railroad for fleeing Nazis. There's some bits about this story that, for me, are just fantastical. However, you can never knock an eyewitness. We have a place you can hide in plain sight. We have a date that fits in with the end of the war in Berlin. And then you chuck an eyewitness in who says he saw Adolf Hitler here. You can't erase history. You can still see the imprint if you look really carefully. What we're here doing is looking really carefully. Here, the Nazis used to take off their hood and eat in silence. Wow. Yeah. Is there any documentation that I can see that supports all this that you're talking about? No, because the library was uh, in the place where the German used to stay. But there was a fire. Of course there was. Yeah. In 1950, the area where the Germans used to live and the library next door all burnt down. Well, I'm just going to have a chat, and then uh, we'll have a chat with you guys. Whole thing went up like a that part of the history and more went up in a puff of smoke. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind this is a safe haven for somebody that's trying to hide. Completely. It's not like you'd keep a ledger going, Nazi in, Nazi out. But now nothing. Bet there's more than one way into this place. There would be ways only known to the abbot. They had tunnels for the water, but the plans of the monastery doesn't appear in the tunnel. So there are secret tunnels in and out of this building? Of course, of sure. course. The team heads off to investigate one of these mysterious tunnels that could have provided clandestine access to the property. So if this goes outside of the walls of the monastery? Yes. Oh, yes? OK. Yes. We don't know where that leads to. Not yet. All right, let's take a look. Right. Got about 50 yards on a tunnel that was up top, and now there's a smaller one underneath it, which you had to crawl through. Now this thing goes pretty far. OK. Not much air in here, guys. This thing ends right here. It's bricked up. Ah, bet if I could have got through that wall, I'd have been on the other side of the wall of the monastery. Knowing that the Germans were here, they were comfortable, they were welcomed. To have now a tunnel underneath the monastery is, is pretty significant. I want to find out where this tunnel ended up. What'd you find? There was a tunnel. OK. I probably crawled 100 yards. Boom, brick wall. Uh, you could see where somebody had blocked it off. I, I had to have been on the other side of the monastery, on the other side of the wall. 100 yards to take. Easy. Is there any other building that was owned by the monastery outside of the monastery? See, si, it's very, very close. 50 yards beyond the wall in the tunnel sits a building that was owned by the monastery in the 1940s. After 1943, it became a station for Franco's paramilitary police. Para alquilar solo la Guardia Civil. Guardia Civil. Yeah. Right, so it's not, it's not army. Okay. But it's paramilitary Similar. police force. Yeah, we're military. Yeah, we're these are the tough guys. These are the guys who yeah. run Franco Spain for him. Why would they man this place with paramilitary personnel outside of the monastery? You don't have to answer that question because I believe I have the answer. It's a police station, but the Guardia Civil are far more than police. The Guardia Civil are men who owe allegiance to Franco. You really don't want to meet these guys. Oh, look at this. Holding cells. Yeah. <laughs> There were cell blocks downstairs in the office space, so I was looking in the cell blocks, and every floor was cemented. Look at this. That certainly has been covered over. In one cell, there was a floor that had been cemented in, a, a perfect square, about four by four. 
and part of it was kind of broken. That's a straight shot to something right there. You can see it. I was able to dig in a little bit. I could see straight down. It was definitely a tunnel to some place. Uh, this has been filled in with, with all kinds of dirt and stone. Very loose gravel. Definitely a hole here. Look at this. The puzzle was starting to come together. With the possibility of Hitler being here, concentration of Nazis, General Franco. And now we found this tunnel. There's a good possibility that it was utilized to escort the Germans in and out of the monastery. You gotta remember that I went about 100 yards in a tunnel which would have led right to the building that the Civil Guard resided in. With some sort of an escape route or, or in for somebody. As an investigator, you don't have to hit me with a ton of bricks. Good possibility that's what that tunnel was used for. That should be all I need. So I'll swap out and put the guardian onto this. 7,000 miles away, Tim Kennedy and a team of marine archaeologists prepare for an open ocean dive to identify the mysterious metal objects they detected on the ocean floor. We're going to be extremely conservative. Uh, we're not going to come anywhere near our limits. We're super remote out here. We want to make sure that we're extra safe uh, because help is far away. Sounds like a good plan. Good. Dive leader Joe Hoyt prepares for an expedition that could put them face to face with the U-boat the declassified FBI documents claim delivered Hitler to Argentina. All right, let's go find a U-boat. Let's do it. Looks good. Obviously, the most important thing is to get a positive ID on what's down there. But let's actually get hands on 100% knowledge of what that is. And ho hopefully, it's what we've been looking for, at least a clue to it. That moment right before you roll back into the water, that is the most exciting point because you know that you're about to go see something that maybe nobody's ever seen before, that maybe something incredible. All three divers ago. I dove all of the world. As a Green Beret, we spend almost our entire lives in the water. But being here and then having the real possibility that this is a U-boat off the coast of Argentina, it's, it's hard to, to really put into words how powerful that type of moment is. There is a multi-component signature. So we're searching for pieces. We got to the bottom. The visibility is not fantastic and we start a search pattern. At a depth of 40 feet and battling poor visibility, the team executes a circular search pattern in order to locate their target. They will increase the search circle by 15 feet every rotation in order to thoroughly cover the area where they believe their targets will be. I copy that top side. Say you can't say again, you can't even broken. It looks like uh, something. Here we go. the Argentine coast, the team's state-of-the-art sonar has come across a significant hit. Here we go. Tim Kennedy and Joe Hoyt lead a dive on a metal object they believe could be part of the debris field left by a scuttled German U-boat. Roger, I copy. Uh, you've come across a steel I beam. Yeah, it looks modern. It doesn't look like it's been down here very long. So, definitely not U boat wreckage. It's pretty clear right away what those objects were solid metal beams, you know, on the ocean floor. 
You know, it was just this big punch to the gut. What you have to do is keep executing until you find real evidence. Yeah, copy that. Let's go ahead and continue uh, circle search. Let's see what else we find. After an extensive search of the seafloor, we just came across a couple more components here. The team finds more modern debris, but no U-boat wreckage. There's nothing else around. Don't worry, uh, come back up. You know, you're hoping to see that gun off the deck of a U-boat. Pretty disappointing. Right now, we're stuck with modern trash. I mean, the good thing is that it shows that the equipment and the survey that we're doing is just completely comprehensive. I mean, we found four tiny little pieces of metal out here in the open ocean. With only half of their survey grid complete, the team resets course to continue their hunt for the scuttled U-boat. The only real way to do a survey like this is to do it systematically. And we built a survey area based on the best information that we had. So we're going to go ahead and just continue to see if there's anything there. So hopefully the weather will hold out for us and we'll be able to complete that entire planned survey grid. Good dive. Good dive. Obviously, it was a major disappointment that it wasn't what we were looking for. but. It doesn't change anything. We, st we still have to go back to our search area and keep looking. So this was a small battle, and we're going to keep fighting the big war. You know, we've pledged from the outset of this investigation that we pursue any, any leads. It's a good lead. While the team in Argentina continues their search for a sunken U-boat, Bob Bear and John Sensich discuss a bombshell lead from their investigation in Spain. I guess somebody would have bound to have seen Hitler if he'd escaped from Berlin, and anybody who claims to have seen him, we got to talk to. Absolutely. An eyewitness who claims to have seen Hitler in the Samos Monastery is alive and has agreed to speak with them via Skype from Venezuela, where he now lives. Why was he in a position to be able to see Hitler? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Who is this person? How did he know the information? Did he actually see it? And why should we believe him? Hello. Okay, hello. Thank you so much for your time. We have some, some questions for you. If we go back for a moment, how old were you in 1945? What, what were you engaged in? Construction. OK, great. What I'd like to ask you, just in general terms, what you saw, if anything, related to Germans or Nazis in Spain? In the year 1945, I was doing a secret construction inside the monastery in Samos. We have to build secret compartments, like tunnels. Los Alemanes. And these Germans were Nazis? Alemanes, Nazis, Nazis. Yes. And one of these guys was Adolf Hitler. He was right there. He wasn't wearing muscles or anything. No, So, just for clarification, which, which month? Mayo. Mayo. May. Mayo. 1945, I realized it was really Hitler because of the airplane. Tell me about the airplane. I went to another town. The first thing I saw in this new town was a German airplane. The airplane landed in a potato field that this old man owned. And asked him how many people came in that plane. He said it was five people, and they were German. Did anybody that you know saw Hitler and get off that plane and told you this? The, the owner of the farm, the farm, the, 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 many times, many times, he kept asking that, that, do you think it was Hitler? And the people said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hitler was on that plane. Is that what you're, what you're saying? Yeah. Where exactly was the location of this plane? In a little small town. Perfecto. We have to stop right now, so muchas gracias por todo. Hasta luego, ya? Yeah? What I find interesting here is the fact that our team is in this monastery. They see these secret compartments, and this gentleman built those compartments. That fits very well. We have a witness which places Hitler there in 1945. 
And later, secondhand, this guy hears about an airplane that lands near the monastery. The timeline and the airplane fit our theory how he got out of Germany. If we can find evidence of how that plane landed, we can fit how he got into Spain and how he left from Vigo. This could be our missing link. If there was a plane landed there, undoubtedly we'll find it. Yeah. To get to South America, you need to come through Spain. This is a kind of way, right to South America. Yeah, completely. Lenny DePaul and Gerard Williams head for Cornea, Spain, in search of evidence that could corroborate an explosive eyewitness report. The airplane landed in a potato field. Hitler was on that plane. Is that what you're, what you're saying? Yeah. If a plane did land in this area, it would provide the team with a crucial puzzle piece. How Hitler could have entered Spain before boarding a U-boat in the port town of Vigo. What's up? The people you want me to look for? Yeah. I found them. Did you? Good yeah. stuff. They want to meet. Good job, Pablo. The team's local contact has uncovered a second eyewitness who could provide key corroborating testimony to the events surrounding this plane's landing. Here until they... <laughs> Buenas tardes. Hola, buenas tardes. One of the most difficult things about handling an investigation like this 75 years on is that there are very few, if any, living witnesses to what actually happened. If we're going to tell the story properly, we need to speak to people who were witnesses at the time. Pero entonces, hay entonces 18 años. Yo estaba en el río con una caña cazando truchas. He was fishing by the river. No pensé nada. Me asusté un poco y me cogí. Did the plane crash? No, aterrizó. It landed. What markings were on the aircraft? No doy cuenta. Si había no. It was no paintings at all. Who was on the airplane? Sí, era el soldado. ¿Cuántos? Unos cuatro o cinco. He saw the pilot stepping out the plane, okay. and a few soldiers. Hey Pablo, you think they could show me on my map where the plane uh, had landed? You have to walk the ground, meet people, talk to locals. This is where the plane landed, aquí? And what we're getting here... Thank you very much. German planes landing in northern Spain. This is worth investigating. All right. Lenny heads to the location specified by the eyewitness to see if the terrain would allow for a plane landing. You know, if for a plane to come down in the middle of a field, I want to be able to put that together for myself. Taking a look at the field in the, in the AO, we call it the area of operation that this went down in, it's going to give me a good look at whether or not everything is accurate. So we'll see. It'll be good to be there. OK, we're going to visit what is left of a base. Five miles away, Gerard makes contact with journalist Serafine Terrahoris who has information about German military activity in the same area as the reported plane landing. So there were Germans based here during the war? Es correcto. Yes, that's right. Is that a barracks? Yeah, yeah it is. correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For decades, this site has only been known to locals. This was the main building. If a plane wanted to come to Spain, this would be seriously important to them? They'd know where to find us? Actually, we have here a huge antenna He's telling me that the main point to have these facilities here was to coordinate German aircraft. That's just mind-blowing. Even in, in 1945, this was operating. Even in 1945? Yeah. This is a neutral country during World War II, but this communication is set up with a German radio antenna in it. It's got to be central to the Nazi war effort. What's more important, it's central to the Nazis after the war. This is a nasty nest of vipers right in the middle of Europe. This is pretty hilly, boy. I don't know. Good place to land an airplane. Lenny arrives at the location where the eyewitnesses claim to have seen the plane land. Right here. OK. From a tactical point of view, it's wide open. It's, it's miles and miles of open area. But surrounded by the rough terrain, it would have made it very difficult to land here. 
Lenny is armed with a state-of-the-art survey tool in order to make his determination. Now I'm going to map out the uh, topography and see if this aircraft possibly could have landed. The Tremble TX-5 3D scanner uses razor-thin lasers to create 360-degree topographic maps so accurate it can reveal details down to a single blade of grass. The team will use the terrain survey to determine if a plane could have feasibly touched down based on the elevation, level of the field, and the dimensions of this open space. Now I'm going to download all this stuff, have it evaluated back at the Situation Room, and see what they come up with. Here in the bushes. Gerard heads to investigate an antenna that has just been revealed as the heart of this nearby German military base. They were built in 1940, three okay. of them. What happened to it? Well, all these yeah, antennas okay, fell down. A hurricane put them down. A hurricane put them down? Yeah. This was the base of a 120 meters antenna. 120 meters? Correct. So this installation was built with German technical help. Telefunken. 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 Telefunken, one of the most important um, communications industries in Germany at the time and post war as well. Y eh, eran de, de un material muy avanzada para ese momento. In 1940, the radio transmitters made by Telefunken, we're talking seriously powerful kit. This communications array is pumping out a beam that you can home in on. It's RDF, it's Radio Direction Finder. RDF, or Radio Direction Finding, is a key tool still used to help military ships and aircrafts find navigational points. At ranges in the thousands of miles, these three advanced radio antennas allow for aircraft to triangulate their position, much like modern GPS. This technology would have been one of the only ways to facilitate the secret landing of an inbound aircraft in the remote potato field, five miles away. So you're, you're a German pilot. He takes his bearings from this and the other two around here. You're flying in fog. You can line up on this damn thing and know exactly where you're going and where your target is. This is a lighthouse. It's a beacon. Spain's turning out to be full of surprises, some of them really big. There's a Spanish military base here with German technicians sending out signals to Nazi aircraft, telling them exactly what position they're in. Another wonderful example of Franco's neutrality during World War II. From what we're seeing on the ground here, there's no reason at all why Adolf Hitler, with the aircraft at his disposal, could not have transited through Spain. This is not what you get in the history books. OK, show me the scans that Lenny did. Bob Baer and John Sensich review the 3D laser scans from the field in Spain to determine whether Hitler's airplane could have feasibly landed at that location, as claimed by two eyewitnesses. 8,052 feet, 1405 across. Condor takes about 6,000 feet to land. I've surveyed enough of these fields to tell you, even at a slope like that, you could land it there. Of course, you've got to be able to find the field in the middle of the night. The team has found approximately five miles from this location, Nazi RDF equipment or radio direction finder equipment, which certainly could have been used to aid in the landing uh, of an aircraft. Well, yeah, you, you fly the airplane right down the signal. You take these witnesses, and they seem pretty fantastic. But once you go to the location they give, and right next to it is a radio base, a Nazi radio base, that adds an enormous amount of credibility to what they're saying. I feel really good about getting Hitler to Spain, uh, landing him, getting him across Spain, getting a U-boat out. But what bothers me is this distance is 6,700 miles down to Argentina. And we know that the U-boats that did make that, people got off very sick. After the war, Two German U-boats, U-530 and U-970, surrendered off the coast of Argentina. When these sailors disembarked from their long journey, they could barely stand due to malnutrition, dehydration, and breathing uncirculated air. We know that his physical condition was deteriorating, 
uh, in general. His personal position is providing a lot of details that Hitler was in great pain. We look here, Hitler was suffering from asthma um, and ulcers. I mean, what are the chances he would take a U-boat ride from Vigo, Spain to Argentina? It's not some place you would like to spend a couple weeks underwater. U-boats were very small, confined space. These things were, were coffins. I would want to do this in stages if, if I had a choice. Let's say you split up the trip, how would you do it? There's really only one location. That's the Canary Island. At the end of World War II, the Allies controlled nearly every coastal country along the Atlantic Ocean, leaving the Spanish Canary Islands as the only territory friendly to Hitler. Years earlier, in 1940, Franco and Hitler had met in Andai, France, to discuss secret Nazi use of these strategic islands, although they officially remained neutral during the war, along with mainland Spain. It's perfectly logical. You put the guy on a U-boat here, take him a thousand miles to the Canary Islands, you resupply the boat, take care of him. You could stay there a couple days till he's feeling better and then move him again. So the question that needs to be answered is, could a U-boat have been resupplied in the Canary Islands and could a high value target like Adolf Hitler have used that location to recoup, to regroup, and then eventually make his way to South America? You need to get people out there right now, see if this is feasible. Next stop, Canary Islands. Where does he go when he gets here? Who protects him? Somebody's gonna see him, you know? The team lands in the Canary Islands, an isolated group of volcanic land masses in the Atlantic Ocean, hundreds of miles from the coastlines of Europe and Africa. What's this area here, Pablo? This is Las Palmas de Gran Canaria the capital city of Gran Canaria. Beautiful. They will investigate whether Hitler could have used this highly strategic location as a pivotal point in his escape to the shores of Argentina. We know there were Nazi operations in mainland Spain. Are they going to be here too? We got to work your sources to death. We got to find out anybody that has any knowledge of what went on 70 years ago. You know, for the stuff we're looking for, it's not going to be in the official histories. If we can find somebody who's actually spot on in the 1940s, we're going to learn a lot. We've been looking for the footprints of Adolf Hitler coming down from Berlin all the way to Argentina. Today we get into one of the most important points in that whole journey out. This jump off point to South America. This is key to the Nazi escape route. It's very much like seeing top of a very big mountain. There is still a huge amount more to be discovered. Let's go. Let's go to work. Hurrah! This group violence is strategically really important in World War II. Mm -hmm. Lenny DePaul and Gerard Williams have arrived in the Canary Islands to investigate whether Hitler could have used these remote Spanish islands as a stopping point in his U-boat escape to the shores of Argentina. Why don't you uh, speak to him first, okay? Yeah. Through local contacts, they have tracked down a crucial lead. Hombre, Don Francisco. Francisco Kapoff, whose family owned one of the largest German businesses on the island in the 1940s, a shipping company known as the Warman House. His grandfather was the chief director of the Warman House. Era, era ingeniero. Ingeniero, naval. Naval. No, y también había ingenieros alemanes. ¿Y qué hacían aquí? Porque aquí pasaban barcos que venían con tropas. Okay. Cuando batía el continente. Bueno, cuando venía un submarino adriado, que me iba a reparar, eran ellos. So, when a, a German U-boat arrived here, any, anything that needed to be fixed, mm -hmm. they did it. Pero el torpedo Repairing. lo cargaban aquí, en el barco, después lo llevaban sí, fuera. Cargado, no fue. Ah, ese es el tema. No lo cargaban, no. lo sacaban de los, de los, de los túneles. He's telling me that they did not just repair the, the U-boats. Okay. They also supplied with food, and guns and torpedoes. Wow. Apparently, uh, there was in the island uh, storage for torpedoes, some tunnels. Couldn't believe what he was saying. With respect to the U-boats that were just popping up here in the harbor, General Franco's military wasn't even in the war, and, and they built tunnels that apparently torpedoes were stored there. So they were able to go inland and replenish, bring some food, get on board, and get back out of here. But ask him, though, this is a big secret going on. Nobody knows about this. How did they communicate? 
One, uh, one second. World. One second. He mentioned a word, enigma. Enigma. Is he telling me there was an enigma machine? Había. Aquí había una máquina enigma. Enigma was seriously important. That was the Germans almost impossible to break code. The Nazis would have used Enigma to get their information back to Nazi Germany and also to get orders instructions from Nazi Germany. To find four of them here, they were planning on something huge. The team heads to the tunnels, rumored to have been an ammunition dump to supply Nazi submarines. Secret U-boat bases, a communications network. We need to go there, we need to find out exactly what we can. We're close. It could have been turned into an escape route for Adolf Hitler. So, Pablo, you spoke to Javier on the phone, right? Yes. He knows we're coming? Yeah, he should be waiting for us. Javier Duran, he was the first person to be able to explore these tunnels, to take a look at what was here, why it was here, and how it got here. Son 7,000 meters cuadrados de túneles. 7,000 meters of tunnels around here. And they have a natural ventilation and mechanic one. Okay. The mechanic one was used when trucks got in. Less than a mile from the sea, these tunnels would have been a short drive to potential U-boat landing points, while the surrounding hills would camouflage the tunnels themselves. You can drive trucks through these Yeah, tunnels. yeah, yeah. Sí, 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 sí. La, el, los camiones entraban tenían una un, para la bajada de torpedos. That tunnel mm -hmm. from there, that's the torpedo one. Can we, uh, can we take a look at those tunnels? Can we visit those tunnels? Yes, yes, yes. These are entrances here, these two. It's quite incredible. Here, we're surrounded by military installations. The Nazis build underground like cathedrals above ground. They're serious in their scope and size. And this feels very Germanic. It's incredible. We have no idea what was going on on these islands in the dark days of World War II. It has an amazingly dark history. And it's something that must be told. Next time on Hunting Hitler. This is not a vacation home. This was built for a reason. Everything points to this being used to get high-ranking Nazi officials out of Germany and to safety. Sometimes this costs millions. Germans' fingerprints are all over this place. It just goes on forever. I mean, this place was, was gearing up for war. I don't care whose name the title was in, it was a German base. So is it possible to see the house? We better not go there, you know? Well, I think we will go there. If I'm going to hide a high-value target, this is perfect. We have to get on here. We can't be compromised. Stop, stop, stop. And I got somebody coming. There's not sufficient evidence. Yeah, Hitler died in the bunker in April 30th, 1945. Could Adolf Hitler gotten out of Berlin, and how did he do it? How did he enter Argentina? We're going to look at who could facilitate hiding Hitler.